always with Dad from the age of five. As soon as I could do anything, walk, talk, I was always with Dad going to the races. And I can still remember the days that Dad would pick me up on Tuesday for a sport day and I'd miss sport and I'd go to Harold Park. I'm sure everyone's going to miss going to Harold Park on a Friday night. It's just got such a great atmosphere about it. In 1899, commuters relied on ferries to cross the magnificent Sydney Harbour. The bridge was still 33 years away. By land, horses were the established mode of transport. The trotter, with its perfect temperament and boundless stamina, was popular with tradesmen. Just four kilometres from the foreshore in the suburb of Glebe, trotting as a sport was in its infancy. It would become intrinsic to the city's culture, its way of life, the highs and the lows embedded in the psyche of six generations. Famous for its ethnic restaurants, alternative culture and 19th century architecture, Glebe was originally set aside by Governor Arthur Philip for the Church of England following the arrival of the First Fleet. So the Church of England weren't particularly happy with this land, so they put it up for sale in about 1828. And a chap called George Allen, who eventually became one of the presidents of uh, Westpac, or Bank of New South Wales as it was then, bought the land. By 1890, the five-acre block on the corner of Wigram Road and Ross Street had been developed into Lily Bridge Athletic Grounds. It included a 430-metre right-handed track predominantly used for pony racing. So the first meeting they didn't have any um, trotting races, but on February the 6th they had the first ever trotting race and it was won by a little pony trotter called Ivo Bly. In the early races at Lily Bridge, there were few sulkies. Most horses were ridden and handicaps were given as weights. It was the first track in Australia to conduct a trotting race under lights, but safety concerns forced its closure in 1898. Meanwhile, construction on the Johnston's Creek stormwater channel dramatically improved the landform adjacent to Lily Bridge and provided an opportunity to build a much bigger circuit on the reclaimed swamp. A 1,000 metre left-handed cinders track was the result. By then, the businessman, Joynton Smith, had taken over the lease. He changed the name to Forest Lodge. Well, Forest Lodge is the name of the suburb. And that's where it came in, they Forest Lodge, where Glebe and Forest Lodge is combined. And that's where the Forest Lodge comes into it. The first winner at Forest Lodge was Judge Hewan, who returned a mile of 2 minutes 53 seconds. He's became a champion side down in Tassie and, and side ancestors of like Pure Steel was probably one of the great ones uh, that he goes back to a mare by Judge Hewan. And they had about, ooh, about 50, 60 meetings at uh, Forest Lodge, but there was mainly pony trotting. They didn't really have a full trotting meeting until about February 1902. They ran two five race meetings. 
Forest Lodge was also the venue for the first New South Wales Trotting Club meeting nine months later. It featured a time trial by the champion trotter Fritz. Fortunately, it wasn't much racing for him, so he probably, I think he had less than 20 starts, but he was just dominant, totally dominant. His best time of 2 minutes 13.4 seconds stood as an Australian trotting mile record for 28 years and the New South Wales record for a staggering 39 years. Fritz was bred, owned, trained and driven by John Buckland, one of the sport's early pioneers and benefactors. John Moriarty had the honour of being the founding New South Wales Trotting Club president and Richard C Hungerford the first secretary. He was everything. He used to write the form guide, he used to do the race books, he was registrar, he was handicapper. The club conducted just one further meeting at Forest Lodge before relocating to the spacious 1400 metre Kensington Racecourse. They held 26 meetings there in less than 18 months before returning to Glebe in July 1904. Well, they went back in 1904 and found that uh, Joint and Smith had changed the track. The tramway board had grabbed some more land so the track went from five and a half furlongs to four furlongs. And that's when it was changed to Epping. Not long afterwards, the New South Wales Trotting Club purchased Epping for £18,000. Over a century later, it would be sold for more than 5,000 times that amount. The majority of races in the early days at Epping were won by horses under saddle. It provided an enormous advantage for the outstanding horseman Gus Milsom, who won four Epping premierships. In 1911, the New South Wales Trotting Club became the controlling body for the sport statewide. By the end of 1912, it had already registered 98 clubs and show societies. In 1914, James Barnes took over as president. He held the position for 26 years, the longest reign in the club's history. Sydney's leading horseman was Peter Riddle. He claimed seven driver's premierships between 1911 and 1920. Riddle later turned to thoroughbred racing and owned and trained the outstanding stallion Shannon. Meanwhile, in 1916, the legendary Globe Derby claimed the flying race record at Epping. It was one of 15 career victories, but his true greatness was measured at stud. Purchased by the prominent Tasmanian breeder Edgar Tatlow, Globe Derby was Australia's greatest colonial sire. The outstanding rainsman Jack Eddy was a premiership winning driver three times. He trained the record breaking Dixie's Chance and the 1931 New South Wales Trotters Derby winner Lou Spear. In 1923, Frank Howe became the secretary of the New South Wales Trotting Club and served in that role for 18 years. During the mid 1920s, serious consideration was given to selling Epping, which by then had a value of £35,000. It wouldn't be the last time that a proposed shift from Glebe would stir emotions. By the end of the decade, Sydney had the largest ferry operation in the world, with almost 30 million passengers a year. Not surprisingly, that number would drop to just 13 million following the opening of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. In 1929, to avoid confusion with the northwestern Sydney suburb, Epping was renamed Harold Park in honour of the American bred stallion Child Harold. A winner of races in six European countries, Child Harold was imported to New South Wales in 1882. He stood at Andrew Town's Hobartville stud near Richmond and made a significant contribution to the Australasian breeding industry. Meanwhile, the fiery Jerry MacDonald created a Harold Park record that would remain unsurpassed, 
He won 10 Drivers' Premierships, nine of them in successive years between 1923 and 1931. In one year he drove 52 and a half winners, that was sometime in the 1930s. Now it took until 1987 before Brian Hancock drove more winners than that, so that's just an amazing achievement by this fellow. McDonald's monopoly was broken by Jack Watts. He claimed nine Harold Park drivers' premierships over the next 12 seasons. Jack Watts had a special affinity with the New South Wales Pacers Derby. He won the race four times with Country Boy, Radiant Waller, Blue, and in 1960, Sun Chief. We weren't big betters. Uh, Dad wasn't a big, a, a big gambler. And his judgment was often pretty good. And uh, a couple of horses we got up at pretty good odds, 100 to 1 chances, and thought they could have a good chance of winning. And on two or three occasions, that was very helpful. Jack Watts guided Captain Sandy to victory in the 1950 Inter Dominion Grand Final at the Melbourne Showgrounds. Much later in his career, he enjoyed success with the champion mare, Siberia. She was the first horse to win 20 races at Harold Park. Yeah, I'd say she's got to be the best mare to have raced at Harold Park. She had three trainers. She was first trained by Alf Phyllis, then by J.D. Watts, and then by Merv Adams. And she won races for all of them. She did win 10 races at Harold Park in a single season, and I think in that season she set a prize money record too. I read an article where Sabinia um, won something like 40, 30 or 40 thousand dollars, but in those days that was a huge amount of money. That would buy you a couple of properties at least. Jack Watts partnered the great Kiwi Caduceus in back-to-back -back Lord Mayor's Cup victories in 1956 and 1957. He also trained Yamamoto to win the first Inter-Dominion Trotters Championship held at Harold Park. The year was 1966. Yamamoto going through on the inside. Watts missed the drive in the final through suspension, but was skillfully replaced by his son, Colin Watts. Dad said, I think we'll try something different. He said, what a, this horse can stay. And when you get in the back straight, kick him up the back straight and make, him, make them chase you up the back straight. Then you can coast down the, the home straight. And that's what I did. The was out with a good lead in front. I set sail up the back straight and everyone was, must have been chasing me pretty hard because I wore them out, you know. And Grammar will have to go around the outside about five lengths back now under the wind and perhaps beat him. Yamamoto leads into the straight, has the straight, Maori Miss behind them, Grammar down the outside, Yamamoto now under the whip, out wide, Grammar is coming with a tremendous burst, Yamamoto on the inside, that's it! Well, I was hopeful I'd won. I, Ray Conroy, who was broadcasting from the back straight, and Ray nodded his head, and that was uh, a very uh, nice feeling. It was a better feeling when the, when the number went up, though. <laughs> Colin Watts later trained many outstanding horses in his own right, including the 1968 Harold Park Spring Cup winner, Ollie Gard. Well, I had two of the greatest, I think. I would say Walla Walla and Caduceus. In the late 1920s and early 1930s, Walla Walla thrilled crowds with breathtaking performances from huge handicaps. A son of Globe Derby, he spawned the aphorism further back than Walla Walla. I've heard it on a grand call, I've heard it on thoroughbred call, and he was just an amazing horse. He had huge handicaps to race against. On one occasion at Harold Park, he won a 12 furlong race from a back mark of 180 yards. In 1933, also at Harold Park, Walla Walla smashed his Australian mile record in a time trial. He clocked a stunning 2 minutes 2.4 seconds. That mark stood until 1940, 
when it was lowered to two minutes and two seconds, again in a time trial at Harold Park. This time by the unhoppled Lorne Darby. A few years earlier, Lorne Darby became the first pacer outside North America to break two minutes for a mile, recording one minute 59.4 seconds at Addington in Christchurch. When Walla Walla raced, uh, there was no derby at Harold Park. But in Lorne Derby's time, they had started the derby off and uh, he won it. But um, there's a strange story about that too. They believe that he was doped. He was given some sort of a, um, uh, a drug that uh, was supposed to have taken effect when the horse was taken to Harold Park, but it didn't take effect till much later. But the horse recovered and, and uh, he turned out to be a champion. Lawn Derby won 31 races and left an indelible mark as a sire, especially during the early years of night trotting at Harold Park. He was driven by Jack O'Shea, a legend of Sydney trotting. O'Shea also trained Springfield Globe, who was mostly driven by his son Peter. The leading sire at Harold Park during the mid-1950s, Springfield Globe is the only Inter-Dominion winner to also sire an Inter-Dominion winner. That horse was Tactician. Peter O'Shea also raced the courageous Smoke Chief. Harold Parkey won the Sires Produce Stakes and a heat of the 1964 New South Wales Pacers Derby. In 1940, Ernie Ireland was voted the fourth president of the New South Wales Trotting Club following the passing of Joe Davis. Davis had been in the job for just two months. The following year, Norm Hollier took over as secretary. Hollier had started as an office boy in 1918 and in all spent 38 years with the club. In 1939, Australia entered World War II after Britain's ultimatum for Germany to withdraw from Poland had expired. Harold Park continued to race during the war years. One of the outstanding performers was Linda Steele. She was owned by Alton Cusick, who later served as club president from 1954 to 1960. Miss Lornham, the 1940 New South Wales Pacers Derby winner, and Master Dixie were other wartime heroes. Master Dixie won 16 races in total, 13 of them in Sydney, and was trained by the exceptional horseman, Herb Chant. He actually won the first premiership down in Melbourne. Melbourne started up a couple of years earlier than uh, Harold Park. Uh, all the New South Wales people rushed down because of the big stakes, all exciting night trotting. And Mr. Chant, have you trialled this um, filly at all? This filly, last Sunday I trialled her trial at Bankstown with open company and she run, got beat ahead for third place. Dad, well if I may, I'm, I'm not being biased, but he was a genius in, as a horseman. Well, he won uh, three, I think the Goldman sapling stakes, the two-year-old saplings. He, uh, they were, I think they contested four, he won three and he got a fellow to drive the fourth one for him and the idiot m murdered it. Oh. He should have walked in. And you're interviewing the idiot now. <laughs> Which I know doesn't account for much, but... Les Chant followed in his father's footsteps and created a host of driving records from a young age. Chant was associated with the powerfully built stallion Dakar and had a tremendous affinity with fillies and mares. A lot of people didn't like training mares. And Dad was pretty good with mares also, and maybe that was one of the reasons that they always had to be a bit careful. Mares was a little bit different to try and do to uh, the entire or well, the male gender. Sparkling Pearl made history by reaching free-for-all class as a three-year-old filly. 
Sparkling Pearl by a length and a half to facing Lorna. The three deep gold rush girl. While Sparkling Pearl had electric speed, Chance best mare was Gold Rush Girl. She stormed up to money provider. Gold Rush Girl hit the lead close to home and is racing away to win well. A winner of 41 races, 12 of them at Harold Park, Gold Rush Girl later became a successful broodmare for her breeders Kevin and Kay Seymour. Here we have, down here at Harold Park this morning, uh, Frank Jones with his champion trotting mare, Gramble. Tell us a little bit about it, will you, Frank? Oh! <laughs> Well, there's not much to say, Cedric. You can see how she is. She's all stirred up. She's Les Chant regularly drove the champion South Australian trotting mare, Grimmel, during her visits to Sydney. He was in the sulky when she clocked the then Australian mile record of 2 minutes 1.2 seconds in a time trial at Harold Park. New England under the web, an hour later. Remarkably, it was a world record on a half mile track. Grimmel won 51 races, including two Spring Trotters Cups at Harold Park, the second of them in 1965, from 96 yards behind. She had few little characteristics about her. You could, she wouldn't even try if a toe was pulled down. You know, now we had to be out. It was not directly up, but. Halfway uh, between straight up and level. Outside, nothing between the two of them. By the late 1940s, it became increasingly obvious that the sport would struggle to survive without the introduction of night trotting. It had already been a huge success in Perth, Adelaide, and Melbourne. Ironically, the New South Wales champion Silver Peak was the leading stake winner in Melbourne's first season of night trotting. Silver Peak won the 1946 New South Wales Pacers Derby at Harold Park and was outstanding at stud. He claimed the inaugural AG Hunter Cup in 1949. They even named the lolly box. We went down there, lolly Silver Peak on the, on the box. <laughs> oh, they used to go mad when he... He'd make a big sprint up the back and he'd catch him up and win. Silver Peak was one of just 25 foals by Peak Hill, himself a New South Wales Pacers Derby winner. Peak Hill was bred by the Hando family and so named after the Western District's town from where they hailed. We used to break in most horses between us, I ride them. Oh, we rode all the, all the horses we broke in, we rode. Rode them around the farm, did the farm work. Get here a hard driven to go to the lead. Eric Hando also bred the classy mare Skatira, who won back to back spring cups at Harold Park in the mid 1960s. She was trained and driven by Jack Leonard. And going to run home an easy winner. Hard driven to the line, Skatira. Skatira was by Scottish Brigade, the leading sire at Harold Park in the 1966 67 season. Scottish Brigade also sired Rachel McGregor. She won 11 races from her 19 starts at Harold Park, including the inaugural Lightning Mile. In late 1948, legislation was passed in the New South Wales State Parliament that paved the way for night trotting to become a reality in Sydney as well. Harold Park's last day meeting was on Saturday, December 18, 1948. They had to reorganise the track and make it a, uh, an oval-shaped track as best they could because they wanted to put a, a ledger in and they wanted to put a flat in. And um, they did it, but it shortened the track to uh, just under four furlongs. And they had a trial night to test them out and gosh, what an experience, I've never forgot it. There was a tremendous cheer went up when the lights were switched on. So there was more lights on Harold Park than the other trotting track in the world. It was lit up like a ferris wheel. A crowd of almost 16,000 witnessed the inaugural seven event card on Saturday October 1. A total of 193 bookmakers fielded at the meeting. The first race was won by Alta Volo, and fittingly driven by Sutton McMillan. 
a leading Harold Park rainsman for several years, Macmillan won six day premierships between 1938 and 1948. He also collected a Harold Park Knight Premiership in the 1953-54 season. He was one of the great pioneers uh, of trotting in the daytime and the nighttime era. And uh, he trained his team, of course, on the Harold Park track. Very rarely used the whip, had incredible composure, uh, great posture for driving, and the horses just responded for him. How many dry, uh, winners you have driven? Now then, it's a hard question. I've never went through them or anything else, but I've got 360 photos, winners at Carroll Park and Victoria Park in an album. You have? 360. My first introduction, I went around there at 4 o'clock one night, found his stables, and uh, the first thing they did, sit down and have a drink with us, you know, and they poured me out a, a nine ounce glass of um, gin, pure gin. I thought, oh, I can't handle this. <laughs> Yes, so that was uh, my first introduction to um, Southern McMillan. McMillan's had a wide gateway down there and used to just push across for the horses and the, the float and everything to go in. The cars parked all up here, all up Hereford Street, all in the side streets and that, you know. And God help anybody that parked in that driveway on trot night. <laughs> they'd come home and they'd have flat tyres and everything, you know. The highest money earner in the first two years of night trotting at Harold Park was Jack Hope. He was originally trained by Tom Wilson and later by Jack Lewis. And he was a, a wonderful horse. A wonderful horse. He, he won from 60 behind and used to put up sterling efforts every night and run places every night. And he was this, one of the glamour horses at the time, beautiful chestnut horse. Meanwhile, the revered horseman, Jim Caffin, emerged as a major force. Even though he was the top trainer, driver in, in those days, he still worked. He, he, he had a, a daytime job. He worked as a drover at the Flemington Sale Yards. And he combined working there uh, with you know, training a team of horses until eventually the, the team just got so large and he, he had to toss in the job at the, the Sale Yards. How much importance do you place on a uh, swimming or race horse? Well, some of them say there's three minutes that equal to a mile run. We don't take much notice of that, like we swim hours 10 and 12, some 14. Caffin chalked up six drivers' premierships and five trainers' premierships in 12 seasons. We make them swim and swim quick and very short. He built a peerless record in juvenile classics, with such horses as Eden Monaro, Dale's Gift and Great Cheer. Jim Caffin was also a master with trotters. He would go to extraordinary lengths to ensure success, as was the case with the trotting mare Beryl Scott. She was driven by Sulky from Caffin's Granville stables before competing at Harold Park. It was a distance of 20 kilometres. Beryl Scott, she was a highly strung, nervous sort of mare, trotter, square trot gator, and um, she used to drive her down Parramatta Road to Harold Park her race nights and used to settle her down better and she'd trot a bit better. For the run home and it's all over. Hammerhead, uh, well, one third of the way down the straight as the other turn into the straight. Caffin also enjoyed a wonderful partnership with the New Zealand bred trotter Hammerhead for the Aiken family. Hammerhead first over the line. Jim Caffin as a race driver could win on 33 to 1 chances. And that's the true hallmark of, of talent. He could win on the weak ones. Dale's Gift under the whip. Tipperary Blue coming hard on the outside. An outside for Kate Scott. Dale's Gift hanging on. Tipperary Blue coming hard down the outside. Oh, a three-way photo. Hiding Tipperary Blue. In 1950, Bill Dunlop took over the presidency of the New South Wales Trotting Club. He led a divided committee and just four years later did not seek re-election. When Harold Park staged its first inter-dominion in 1952, it was attended by more than 116,000 people, including a crowd of 38,000 on grand final night. Avian Derby won his opening two heats in track record time, before being scratched from the third and final round due to a bout of colic. More than two years earlier, 
at an early Harold Park night meeting, Avian Derby was sensationally back to win a qualifying stakes. Sylvie Gray was the name of the uh, trainer driver. Told his um, owners and connections that they'd win with Peerless Peter and the money that they won from that they'd put on Avian Derby and later in the night. So anyway, Peerless Peter won the race uh, early in the night and they had plenty of money to, to put on to uh, Avian Derby. His odds firmed from six to four on to six to one on. Unsurprisingly, he went on to score an effortless win. It's the first horse I've ever known, then or since, when the bookmakers refused to take any bets on Avian Derby. But back to the Inter-Dominion. Avian Derby, for all his health problems, still lined up in the championship decider as a six to four on favourite. Starting from 24 yards behind, he became hopelessly pocketed, but when clear, he raced away with the $20,000 event. Once again, it was a track record. Avian Derby was handled by Victorian rainsman Darkey Wilson in place of the suspended Silv Bray. Here's Andy Ospek, they're coming with a great run, moving up quickly from Princess Light. Silv Bray hailed from Tamora and later bred and owned the luckless Adios Victor. A perennial runner-up in major races, Adios Victor finished second in the Victoria Derby, an Inter-Dominion Grand Final and a Hunter Cup, but still amassed over $100,000 in prize money. Drummer Chief holding on, Adios Victor doing better, they get down near the line. In January 1954, the freakish Rabans time trialled at Harold Park in a stunning 1 minute 58.7 seconds. He became the first horse in Australia to break two minutes for a mile. Rabans was just one tenth of a second outside the world record on a half mile track. I think uh, Ribbons was the one that I, I paced like for those horses when they broke the records. And Ribbons was the greatest trier and the hardest, toughest horse I've set beside. In all, he won 16 times at Harold Park, including the 1954 Spring Cup and a career total of 41 races. He was the uh, first real champion that I saw. He was a bad beginner, notoriously uh, um, bad at the start. He'd get into his hobbles, he'd chase them, and quite often he'd beat them. Uh, he'd have been a sensation out of the mobile barrier. He never saw a mobile gate, uh, more's the pity. Uh, but he was a horse of enormous ability and enormous speed. His most memorable win was the AG Hunter Cup at the Melbourne Showgrounds. After starting from a 48-yard handicap, Rabans lost a further 50 metres when the tapes were released. He still won by 20 metres, eclipsing the track record by more than a second. Eventually went to America, and that's a story in itself. I don't know how many flights, uh, about four or five flights. Eddie Cobb uh, uh, trained Rabans in America in, uh, in his twilight years, even Rabans twilight years, and I think he won five or six races over there. And he provided me with one of my greatest lifetime thrills in the early 1970s when his owner, Frank Kellaway, brought him back from New Zealand where he'd been standing at stud for seven or eight years with only moderate success. And uh, I'll never forget that morning. It was a Friday morning when I turned up at Dennis Smith's property at Castle Hill and saw with my own eyes uh, the horse that I'd hero worshipped so long ago. I loved him. Rubens was every bit the public idol. He received a hero's welcome when he returned home to Cowra many years after his retirement from racing. Rubens had entered the Penrith stables of leading horseman Purse Hall in 1951. It was at the same time that Hall, a former butcher, secured his initial Harold Park trainers and drivers premierships. He claimed the identical double the following season and in the early 1960s 
won another three drivers' premierships and two trainers' premierships. Hall won the 1964 Spring Cup with Blazing Globe, the son of the Harold Park winning Mayor Thelma Globe. Blazing Globe is in front, out wide, both crowd is making some sort of a run but a fair way from them. Blazing Globe first. First you have to train them hard and, uh, and, and he drive them hard and uh, he, he always believed that uh, when a horse was in winning form to keep it going. I never realised I was on the fence one night with the horse and was pulling his, pulling his brains out and I'm, I'm PJ Hall's outside me and I said, Mr Hall, I'm in trouble. He said, well, that's your problem. Hall was associated with a number of top-class performers of both standard bred gates. During the 1960-61 season, the outstanding pacer James Scott won what was then a record 11 races at Harold Park, including the Lord Mayor's Cup. James Scott is still the leader in second place under the whip, Ross Lawn. Out wide, Battle Clean coming with a run and lose hope in on the rails. But James Scott's going to win it. James Scott first. He won all three heats and the final of the 1962 Inter-Dominion in Perth. Amazingly, he ran a track record in winning the first heat, he ran a track record in winning his third heat, and he ran a track record in the grand final. But James Scott is giving a great exhibition. Lose up the only danger around the turn. They straighten up for the run home. James Scott first around the turn has got the grand final run. Is holding loose up and the horse keeping it going. And James Scott goes to the line uh, to win by two lengths to lose hope. Another brilliant performer trained by Purse was Van Hall. He was unbeaten in six starts as a two year old, including the sapling stakes at Harold Park. Van Hall held three race records at headquarters. Uh, Ruby, owned, Ruby, his wife owned Van Hall, and he ended up becoming a very good stallion later in, in later years. Queen B was arguably Hall's best square gator. She won multiple Trotters Cups at Harold Park in the early 1960s. Uh, Queen B on the outside is moving up to challenge and go to the lead. Prince Rand on the rails is Queen B and Legal Raider flashing home. But Queen B beat Legal Raider third with Prince Graham. They were following... She was in an era where there were some magic Trotters. Hall also drove Bay Johnny to win the 1976 Inter-Dominion Trotting Grand Final in Adelaide for trainer Snowy Finn. In 1977, Purse Hall became the first rainsman to win 500 races at Harold Park when he guided Ron Robin to victory. Ron Robin trying to get to Brian Adios, Brian Adios, Ron Robin doing the better and Purse Hall drives home and wins another race. It was just a few months prior to his forced retirement at the age of 65. Purse Hall also trained for Bob and Jack Ingham during their most serious foray into harness racing in the 1960s and 1970s. The Ingham brothers won a number of Harold Park owners' premierships and raced numerous outstanding horses. I think one of the nicest, as far as manners were concerned, uh, an impeccable racehorse in every way, was a lovely little horse called Born to Trot. And I know he was one of Bob, Bob Ingham's personal favourites. Bob Ingham, in particular, loved the trots, and he loved to bet. He was arguably the biggest punting owner in Sydney's trotting history. He put up to become uh, a member of the committee, and he was defeated because they said he bets too much. He, he'd have bought horse after horse, you know, and uh, it, it was good for trotting. Even in 1970, membership to the club was restricted to just 300. It had been as low as 50 in the pre-war days. They used to uh, um, have um, proxies and all sorts of things that allowed them to dictate as to who was going to be on the committee and all this sort of thing. I stood up at the meeting and I said, gentlemen, thank you very much to everyone that voted for me and our team. I said, but uh, seeing I missed out in getting on, uh, it's not, no, I'm not being sour or anything, it's practical. I said, oh, you'll never see me at the trots again. And I said, I'll be ringing all my trainers, of which I had nine, tonight and telling them to put my horses on the market for sale. 
And that was a very hard thing to do because I loved the trots. Years earlier, the media tycoon Sir Frank Packer applied to become a member of the New South Wales Trotting Club. Famously, and some would say farcically, he was asked to front a credentials committee. Unsurprisingly, he declined the offer. <laughs> now, he was prepared then to spend a huge amount of money buying horses. He loved a bit, you know, on, on the trots. And, uh, and, and I missed out on my oh, oh, genius. You know. But despite that, the club was progressive in other areas. They added the spring and summer carnivals in the season of 1952-53 and introduced head numbers following a close, mud-spattered finish that left the judge unable to identify the winner. In 1954, the New Zealand-bred square gator Krakatoa lowered the Australian mile record for trotters in a time trial at Harold Park. His time was two minutes and six seconds. The following year, the erratic but high-class trotting mare Sandon recorded two minutes 4.2 seconds in another Harold Park time trial. She was driven by Bert Alley, who had also developed a wonderful association with the brilliant pacer Uncle Joe. A true testament to Alley's horsemanship, Uncle Joe won 17 races at Harold Park including the Spring and Summer Cups of 1954, before an injury and forced retirement. Hello, Uncle Joe stretching right out now, putting a gap in them, and uh, the big son of Robert Darby came to the post, full of running, and Uncle Joe beat the fast finishing Rib Ams, who got second, Wilbur's host uh, He was just a uh, more reliable horse off, a, off the mark, and he'd lead in a lot of racing. Like, he beat Rib Ams three times on equal marks in free for all. Apmat galloped off the mark and still... Another of Ali's stable stars was Apmat, a winner of 16 races at Harold Park, including multiple cups. Apmat joins heroic action, heroic action in front. Apmat and his red win flashing home. They hit the line, all it's close. Leave it between Apmat, heroic action and red win all in line. One of the historic trotting races paced down under is the Tom Austin Cup. As the curtain falls on the night trotting season at the Harold Park Raceway each year, the eyes of the trotting world are on Londonderry. In past years, great champions have taken out the race, including the mighty Apmat, driven by Bert Alley to victory in 1959. Opening of the International Pacing Series at Yonkers Raceway, New York. And number eight, Apmat, another down under race, now U.S. owned. Alley took Apmat to North America in 1961, after being invited by the Yonkers Raceway president, Marty Tannenbaum. And they're off. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Monty Tannenbaum, uh, the president of Yonkers Raceway. You, you really enjoy our racing? Yes, very much. It, it, it's a different, I think, than the racing we have uh, in our country. Hmm. And, um, uh, you know, the, our racing strip is, is a much wider racing strip. Pardon and me, just uh, Marty yes. in a moment to correct George. It's Marty, George, not Monty. Oh. Marty Tannenbaum. Well, well, on Marty, yes. and now what is the purpose of you coming to Australia? He claimed the international pace and the good time pace, upstaging the world champion Bye Bye Bird in the process. Probably Australia's best performed horse ever overseas, but Bird Alley will always tell you that Uncle Joe was better. It's, it's interesting when you compare the two records. I mean, that, that had a probably better record. He won, won America and he also won in Wales in England on his way back home? Well, yes, I thought that he did terribly well because he went to a strange country, strange food, uh, strange conditions and everything. Uh, very, very different to our, to our climate, to our feed, to our racing and everything. And yet, uh, out of two, out of three runs, well, he won two of them and won a real good fourth in the last one. He's the best horse in the world. What do you reckon? He's the best horse in the world. Well, I think if your dad now will help you on the horse now and we'll show our viewers how docile he is. Around the turn and Apmat looks as though he has the 5,000 pound summer cup all parcelled up. He's coming to the uh, line full of running, although the other horse, Blue Hope, is finishing well. Bird Alley, he was a hard man to get around. If he was following Bird Alley, 
when you pulled out to come around, he had a whip about eight foot long, he had to go an extra cart wide. <laughs> Oh, Bert. It's the test out wide, flashing home. It's going to be close. Very close. Keep the test all little Maori. Turn on. We love one night and he got out of the gig. He abused and hell out of me what I did. I wasn't too sure to this day what I did do to cause it. Then the other stewards come around the track, get out of the car. Which you didn't go off the track then until the correct right was announced and that. And they said, what's going on here? What's going on here? Bert said, Tony and I are having a yarn. That's what we're doing. Ain't we, Tony? And I said, yeah, and that was that. So they couldn't do nothing. <laughs> Ellie won the 1966 Lord Mayor's Cup at Harold Park with the underrated Stormy Bruce. And double Andy on Stormy Bruce on the outside. It's flashing home. Bert Lee hanging on. Stormy Bruce comes through and wins. The Lord Mayor's Cup was Bert Alley's final feature race triumph at Harold Park. Shortly afterwards, he was suspended by stewards for six months. Believing that he was harshly treated, Alley vowed to never drive in New South Wales again. Disappointing for a bloke who had put so much into the sport and said so many great horses. Alley relocated to Melbourne, where he had further success with both standard breads and thoroughbreds. We have an old favourite here, a health. Yes, I think he's everybody's favourite. Shelgrit. In the mid-1950s, Alf Phyllis dominated the Harold Park Premierships with three drivers and four trainers' titles. We used to describe him as uh, uh, cotton fingers. He'd drive them with a lot of thread of cotton. Uh, great judge of pace too. Uh, had everything, Alf. He was a yeah, very good driver. And high power out wide. He won the New South Wales Pacers Derby three times with Orari, Young Wexford, and in 1966, John Craig. Look, John Craig, all future intangible. Oh, this is very close. Couldn't take it a photo. He could get a horse off anyone that pulled your arms out, and he used to drive with the rain sitting down on the dust sheet. It was a marvel to get him off the bit, you know, to stop pulling. But Phyllis created headlines for other reasons as well. Shortly after Harold Park introduced post-race swabbing in late 1951, he was twice disqualified for five years when horses he trained returned positive tests. But he beat the charge both times. Phyllis was referred to as the last of the straightbacks because of his upright style in the sulky. He was associated with the outstanding Mayor Tarkula, the multiple Harold Park winner Strathfield Jack, the and the 1968 the Miracle Paddy's Mile invitee, Paddy's Night. Uh, Paddy's Night, Phyllis puts the whip away, a great night for Alf tonight. Paddy's Night first, Blazing Globe was second, a uh, close for third between Firstly and Skatera. In 1956, the Inter-Dominion returned to Harold Park. The series was plagued by foul weather. Meetings had to be postponed on four occasions and the grand final was eventually run on a Monday night. It still attracted 34,000 spectators. The Victorian-owned Gentleman John led throughout on the first night of the series, but was unplaced in the ensuing two divisions. My Uncle Bill, when he, when I, when he heard I was taking him over there, he said, You're mad, Eric. I said, Why? He said, They'll run over you. He said he's no better than Wilbur's Hope, and he said, we're not taking him. And I said, well, Uncle Bill, I reckon he's earned a start. I said, I'm going to take him. <laughs> and Rothica was certainly vindicated. In the final, Gentleman John sprinted strongly when clear of a pocket to prevail narrowly over Mineral Spring in a stirring finish. The 1956 Inter-Dominion Grand Final was worth £12,500. By way of a comparison, the Melbourne Cup of the same year carried stakes of £15,000. Eric Rothacker's cousin, Gordon Rothacker, was an iconic figure of Melbourne trotting. He won 14 drivers' premierships and 10 trainers' premierships between 1949 and 1976. Oh yeah, we used to have quite a few battles down there. Yeah, but I was never in the same street as him. He was 
brilliant Gordon. He used to, he was leading driver down there. Yeah, he's a good train and driver, Gordon. Uh, they are followed then by Angelique trying to get through on the outside of him. Jack's right The high class mayor Angelique was trained and driven by Gordon Rothiker. She contested the first Miracle Mile and won multiple races at the Melbourne Showgrounds and Harold Park. And now Angelique is joining in and finishing well. There's nothing between them. Angelique from Victoria first. Such a pretty name. Where did it come from? It came from a television show that was on at the time. A very vibrant and <laughs> over the top lass was in it. And I thought, now that resembles Angel. <laughs> Gordon Rothiker made a number of successful raids on Harold Park, including the 1968 Summer Cup with Rayama Poole. He was the best horse I ever drove. He, he was, he just got to a pinnacle that you couldn't believe, really. And he, he was, you know, when, when he hurt himself, it was just a tragedy. Victorian form student Bill Hutchison was so impressed by Rayama Poole's Shepparton Cup victory, he travelled to Sydney to back him. We got to Harold Park about race four, walked on track uh, with our, still our suitcases in our hands, put them in the uh, secretary's office, walked out. There was a trotters race on, it was won by a Victorian, Karop McKelwin, Brian Gaff, I think it was 10 to 1. But Karop McKelwin is coming out to win. Karop McKelwin. When the horse were up there for Rayama Poole, uh, two races later, saluted in the Summer Cup, and that was a power-packed field. There were horses like Alwes, Binshaw, First Lee, Triax Twinkle, just the who's who of harness racing in those days. And this Victorian Rayama Ball has a big lead, and an unbeatable lead it would appear, and they straighten for the run home. Rayama Ball well out in front of Alwes. However, they get down near the line, and the 10,000 Summer Cup goes to Victoria. He was a great horse, and unfortunately, Two months after that, he was dead. It's uh, a shame, because he would have been, Gordon always said that it was the best horse he's ever had. Rayama Paul, ridden by D. Rothica from Victoria, takes out the 1968 10,000 pound Summer Cup on Harold Park Paceway. A champion square gator of the mid-1950s was Para Rip. He won the Summer Trotters Cup at Harold Park three times, overcoming handicaps of 36, 60 and 96 yards respectively. The outstanding Victorian horseman Bill McKay was a regular feature race winner in the early years of night trotting at Harold Park. He had uh, all them young horses and he used to have them that educated, they'd stand at the barrier and straight out and he'd come to New South Wales and win all the sapling stakes every year. McKay drove the incomparable Philly Argent, who captured the New South Wales Derby and New South Wales Oaks double in 1956. Unbelievably, she won the Derby and Oaks in Victoria as well. It's a feat that has never been repeated and almost certainly won't be. Argent was the mother of Gyro, who won the 1964 New South Wales Pacers Derby at Harold Park when driven by the brilliant George Gath. However, Gyro wins the Derby. Gyro first, Kalara Sky second, then Smoke Chief. They're followed by Grand Garnison, Ramona Brava. And so to the third Inter-Dominion series at Harold Park, which was held in 1960. And what a carnival it proved to be. The local champion, Apmat, was the top point scorer, with two victories and a second placing in his three heats. He was the only multiple winner over the nine qualifiers. Connections of the West Australian visitor Kiwi Dillon pulled off a well-executed plunge in winning a second round division. He was driven by Max Johnson. Joe Turnbull's first kiss cemented his place in the historic final with a victory on night one of the series. Get a horse to go to Harold Park for a start off was something. And then to win a race and to win 16 races at Harold Park was a big thing for 
Now over. <laughs> the Kiwi superstar, Caduceus, now a nine-year-old, was contesting his sixth Inter-Dominion Championship. Caduceus had made four finals with his best result a third in 1956. A second round heat victory in 1960 took his overall tally of qualifying wins to seven. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. J.D. Litton, the uh, trainer driver of that little champion, Caduceus. And what do you think of your chances tonight? I think I've got a good runner's chance. Uh, yes. It depends on the run he gets in the race. Uh, I think uh, he'll stand up and do the job and he can quite easily get beaten. He's uh, come up as well as ever for this Inter-Dominion, the richest he's ever raced in. Uh, on the question of whether he's the best horse, there's lots of good judges say he is and I'm inclined to agree with him. Although uh, horses like Ribbons and Uncle Joe, our local champions, were of the highest quality. But uh, probably Caduceus is the best race horse of them all. A world record crowd of more than 50,000 literally piled into Harold Park for the grand final. I left uh, the trot guide office uh, an hour before the first race so that I can get, get down into the press room. But uh, I can tell you that uh, I didn't make it to the press room. There's a boy out of Perth going to Sydney and, and seeing that sort of crowd and the number of bookmakers was just astounding. And of course the crowd's just right round the track, the ledge are down the back and uh, they're quite a volatile crowd too, they didn't mind throwing pies at drivers that they'd beaten on favourites and whatever else, so it, it was really exciting. The crowd got so big that they had to close the gates and then the crowd pressure from outside was so big that the, uh, they pushed down the gates and the crowd, so whilst it was 50 odd thousand people there that they counted. Then God knows how many people were really there. The final will be run over 13 furlongs and 98 yards, a little over three and a half circuits of Howell Park Raceway. Number nine, Atmat, New South Wales, Bert Alley. Number 10, Caduceus from New Zealand, driven by Jack Litton. In a race of tactics and indeed controversy, it went down to the wire. As they made the run to the winning post with a bell lap coming up in the final, and Ross Lorne is clear of our length from Fettel. Ahead further off, Firestone's Melody. Then followed by Up Madam, then Caduceus and Madeline going together. Right out in the center from Kiwi Villa. At the head of the others, first kiss and false that last. Three furlongs left to go, and Ross Lorne in front from Fettel. On the outside, there followed by Up Mad Caduceus, Firestone's Melody. And there's a fall there, I'll tell you about it later. And as they go to the two furlongs, Ross Lorne is clear. On the outside, Fettel challenging. They're followed by Myers, Rose, Melody and Van Atmuff. And look at the New Zealand, Caduceus pacing now. And for this year, just Caduceus soon after moves up the challenge battle for the lead. Battle just in front as they start to run down the corner. From Caduceus on the outside. Then Myers, Rose, Melody followed by Atmuff. It's battle just in front as they come there to the turn. From Caduceus in front is wearing him down. Then Myers, Rose, Melody and Atmuff. Battle turns down the corner. Caduceus coming at him. And it's battle Caduceus. Making a top scoring Third of the event, Firestro's Melody, followed by Fettel Ross Lawn, then Kiwi Dillon. They're followed closely by Paul Step, a long gap then. And the two uh, first guests followed by Madeleines, and then the driverless horse, uh, Brilliant Moon, whose driver is quite unhurt, absolutely last to greet the judge. When Bert Alley on Atmat fired in a protest against Jack Litton on Caduceus alleging interference in the back straight, the massive crowd erupted with displeasure. The two drivers clashed heatedly inside and outside the stewards' room, but the objection was quickly dismissed. And I spoke to him afterwards and he said, I don't protest that much, but he said, if ever I should have won a protest, that's the protest I should have won. I had a great view of all this, 
um, in the little judge's box, which was right down on the uh, the straight. And um, I didn't think that uh, Ali had grounds for protest, but the stewards were very worried about if they took the race off Caduceus, then there might have been a riot. There was, there was enough of them there to wreck the joint, wasn't there? Thirty, you wouldn't have to demolish it to sell it. You'd have demolished it for you. <laughs> A few years later, Jack Litton revealed that an unknown man had offered him the equivalent of first prize money to ensure Caduceus didn't win the final. Standing at just 14.3 hands, Caduceus was nicknamed the Mighty Atom. He had been a regular visitor to Harold Park, winning two Lord Mayor's Cups and a Summer Cup. All three victories came from 36 yards behind. At one time, Caduceus held track records at Harold Park, the Melbourne Showgrounds, Wavell in South Australia, Gloucester Park and Addington. He campaigned in North America and took a mark of 1 minute 57.4 seconds. All up, Caduceus won 82 races in his 10 seasons of competition. The fourth place getter in that famous Inter Dominion final was the brilliant Fettel. He was trained and driven by Ron Hayes. Fettel won 17 races at Harold Park, including the 1959 Lord Mayor's Cup. First kiss to the night there, joined by Fettel as they started the run down near to the turn into the straight. Oh, well, it was pouring rain and it was tremendous and you could hardly see the horses and all the drivers were splattered in mud and everything. But he did his job. And Fettel had gone to the lead from first kiss. Caduceus on the outside is finishing with a withering run. Here's Fettel and Brad Harkley on the straight. Caduceus is by interest catching up. Fettel is wiggling badly. Caduceus flashes up camera. But Fettel beats Caduceus. He did set a record early in the piece by winning 10 races in a row at Harold Park, which was pretty good in those days because there was only 40 meetings a year run there. Uh, we have ha got uh, some really good horses here uh, and I would say that uh, this season should be one of the best ever. In 1960, Jim Reeves was elected New South Wales Trotting Club President. Reeves was awarded a QBE in 1974 for his services to the sport. In the 1961-62 season, the underrated Lose Hope claimed the Lord Mayor's Cup and was the leading stake earner. He won 13 races at Harold Park for his trainer driver, Merv Adams. Although he never won a Harold Park Premiership, Adams was a highly successful horseman, especially in the late 1950s and 1960s. Well, we had a marvellous time over there. Adams was the trainer and driver of Mineral Spring, who was narrowly defeated in the 1956 Inter-Dominion final. Mineral Spring won the Invitation Flying Mile. It was the first race started using a mobile barrier at a registered meeting in Australia. I can remember it. Uh, Sutton McMillan invented it, and it was a hand pull one, and I can remember the first night I had a ride in it when it went around. In those days, it was a little, it was a, a, a chair with a little foam cushion on it, <laughs> bolted to the floor, and that was it. No protection, not like the beautiful mobiles of today. And you just had the two handles and the gates across, and uh, no protection from the weather whatsoever. Reach for the blue light that indicates the start and close the gate. And then speed away from the horse. Cardigan Bay began fairly well from his 36 yard In the 1962-63 season, the Kiwi champion Cardigan Bay won five races at Harold Park. He is rated by many as the greatest horse ever produced in the Shaky Isles. And in the run home, it's a great horse. It's one of the greatest races this country has ever seen. Cardigan Bay comes down to the line, a great win. Cardigan Bay also claimed the 1963 Inter-Dominion in Adelaide. Cats going in all directions, but around the home turn. 
and Cardigan Bay, the leader from White Tucking, and over on the inside of Cardigan Bay, Plunder Money. Cardigan Bay is Plunder Money from Dusty Miller, who flew home on the outside. The following year, he was sold to a North American syndicate for $100,000. He won 37 races there and took his total prize money to just over $1 million. And to think that he was able to come back after displacing a hip uh, during an Inter-Dominion series in Western Australia and do what he did, he was a freak. And I always remember when I went to America for the first time, got out of a cab and walked into, the, I think it was the Holiday Inn, it was right next door to the Meadowlands, and I walked into the place and I looked over and there was a great big photo on the wall of Cardigan Bay. Oh, I felt better straight away. I said, there's me old mate there. The great New Zealand champion Cardigan Bay will endeavour tonight to be the first horse in the history of the race to win the £5,000 Lord Mayor's Cup from 48 yards for half time. The top tonight Sydney horseman, Bill Wilkins, the shared a wonderful association with Cardigan Bay. He drove him eight times and only tasted defeat once. That was in the 1963 Lord Mayor's Cup. Under the whip now, Cardigan Bay is finishing well. Edgar Kenley is stooling the leader, White Taggy Hanover along. Cardigan Bay is hard at work, uh, driver is hard at work on him. White Taggy Hanover leads uh, from uh, Cardigan Bay. Uh, he, he don't, I don't know whether he can win this. White Taggy Hanover leads well into the straight from Mary Mavis and uh, Cardigan Bay under the whip. But in the straight, White Taggy Hanover is coming away from Cardigan Bay. And now it's all over. White Taggy Hanover first, Cardigan Bay finishing on again. Wilkins trained numerous horses for preeminent breeder Ron Krogan, Tolliver Gigi is shot away on including the, the classy filly Tolliver Gigi. She won a trio of classics at Harold Park as a three-year-old. However, Tolliver Gigi, hard-driven, is going to win, and Tolliver Gigi beats Dyer. Tolliver Gigi was by the North American sire Tolliver Hanover, who was imported to Australia by Ron Krogan. One of the linchpins of the old Bangaroo stud, uh, very good breeder, very smart man who had a lot of horses over the years. He's the funniest man in the world in business. He wanted the last penny. Go, go out with him and he's the easiest man in the world. Well here's one Laurie that needs no uh, introduction. No, Cedric, this is Little Mary. She's By 1963, almost a decade had passed since a new name featured atop of the Harold Park Trainers or Drivers Premierships. Laurie Moulds ended the drought by taking both titles. One of his stable stars was the game chestnut mare, Little Mary. Little Mary down the outside, in the straight now, and Tartula is in front. However, down the outside, Little Mary is flashing up with a tremendous burst. And Little Mary wins, Little Mary first, Bangaroo wins second, Tartula first. Laurie, I think, is the best nickname man I've ever heard. They called him the Dasher, and no man had greater dress sense than, than Laurie. Laurie Moulds was also associated with the classy stallion Don't Retreat, who won 26 races at Harold Park in the mid-1970s. At the time, it was a record which he jointly held with Hondo Grattan. Don't Retreat wins. Don't Retreat first. Koala King second. Maybe two and a half third ahead of Willie Rip. His mother was his backstop. She was a marvellous old lady. She used to go to Harold Park with Laurie and she'd never hose a horse down. She used to have a bucket and get a warm water and she used to sponge them all right over in that way. She said it was too cold to hit them with cold water on the nights. Laurie's mother was Constance Moulds. Although women were unable to compete at Harold Park, they were allowed to participate at some country tracks and Mrs Moulds won numerous races. In the 1963-64 season, Smoke Cloud was the leading stake earner at Harold Park. Now Smoke Cloud comes hard on the outside for Jack Watts. He was owned by Noel Simpson. I suppose I, I didn't even try to work out what I thought might be the broodmare of the year. An influential breeder, Noel Simpson imported more than 40 stallions from North America and had particular success with those by the champion Adios. A winner of 44 races from 88 starts, 
Adios paced six world records before being retired in 1948. Yeah, he was a very, very clever man, Noel, and uh, probably still might have the first, had the first penny he ever earned. He, was, he still drove a hard bargain with the stud masters, but he, he revolutionised the breed here. As a snapshot of the influence Simpson would later have, Deep Adios produced Pale Face Adios, Ike Frost produced the incomparable Maori's Idol, Morris Eden gave us the freakish Mount Eden, and Toledo Hanover was the sire of pure steel. But the son of Adios, imported by Simpson with the greatest legacy, is Thor Hanover. Number seven is Thor Hanover, winner of the Rich Messenger Stakes. The leading Australian sire for more than 10 consecutive seasons from 1975, Thor Hanover sired Rip Van Winkle, Roma Hanover and Gamma Light. In 1965, Voice Derby won both the Summer and Lord Mayor's Cups. Voice Derby was trained by Jack Hazlitt at Walgett in northwestern New South Wales, 700 kilometres from Sydney. And it's a boil over. Voice Derby's going to win. Voice Derby first. Our West Blues may have been second ahead of Sun Facilities at the Harold Park Paceway underwent major renovations in the lead up to the 1966 Inter Dominion in Sydney. The improvements would prove timely, as the grand final was run in arguably the wettest conditions for a Harold Park feature meeting. It attracted the comparatively small crowd of only 25,000. We were drowned. We were standing on the steps at Harold Park down, but we weren't going to move. The Tasmanian representative, Sham for Star, was trained for the series by Max Truer and driven by Brian Forrester. Sham for Star was the three to one favourite on race night, but as much as 200 to 1 had been offered by bookmakers before the series started. Coming to the turn, led by a link now uh, from first lead, here followed by Tactile, and here's the great mayor, Robin Dundee, coming to a great run out wide. Around the turn, Champa Star, the leader. Robin Dundee runs to Champa Star. Robin Dundee and Champa Star fight it out. They hit the line. Champa Star beat Robin Dundee. They'll get the third out wide. They're followed by Tactile. Well, it was that wet, all I wanted to do was get my gear off. In the driver's room, naturally. But, uh, no, uh, it was good. So Roden Cutler was going to come out and do the presentation, but it was too wet, it was raining like hell. So uh, I just weighed in and showered. Sham for Star was a career triumph for veteran trainer Max Truer. Well, I think he's a very good horse, Cedric. And he's well, I think his record really speaks for itself. He, he never ever had much as far as quality goes with horses. But he could get the best out of what he had. The Bankstown District Agricultural and Trotting Society was formed way back in 1942. Their present president, Max Truer. Truer was an influential figure at Bankstown. In the 1980s, the M.H. Truer Memorial was named in his honour. For a young Brian Forrester, Shamfer Starr justified his decision to move from New Zealand to Sydney just a few years earlier. The mouse, Kiwi Mousy, Kiwi is as good a horseman as you'd want to see. Real good driver, you know, real sharp, old-fashioned sort of a driver, you know. Heading up the side though and Karamir Duplicity still travelling all right. Forrester also drove the dazzling sprinter Karamir Duplicity, who was trained by Lucini. She won 19 races at Harold Park in the early to mid-1980s, making her the third most successful mare in the track's history. Brian Forrester took out the driver's premiership in the 1983-84 season. From his 40 wins, 26 were trained by Fran Donahue. Fran Donahue won the corresponding Harold Park Trainers Premiership that season. She was the first and only woman to achieve the feat. I found it pretty stressful, actually, particularly towards the end because I only had a couple of win lead over Kevin Robinson and his, you know, the last few weeks I couldn't train a winner. Donahue's best horse was Lehigh Ladd. He won 18 races at Harold Park, including the opening two divisions of the 1980 Inter-Dominion Championship. 
terrible horse initially. Didn't think I'd ever get him going. But eventually he did get going and he won his first race and he won his last race. The 1966 Inter-Dominion final was also the first Harold Park race transmitted live by the Australian Broadcasting Commission. Their commitment to Harold Park harness racing expanded during the 1970s, with live coverage on a weekly basis. As a result, the average attendance at Harold Park continued to fall, but off-course TAB turnover experienced a corresponding surge. Similar trends would prevail when Sky Channel was launched and expanded in the late 1980s and 1990s. The ABC coverage of Harold Park ended in April 1987. Andy Vincent and David Morrow were the station's harness racing callers. Many of the finest race broadcasters worked at Harold Park, including Ken Howard, Des Hoisted, Ian Craig, John Tapp and Ray Conroy. For many years, Ray Hadley and Kevin Thompson called alongside each other at Harold Park. And one night, all the crowd was out in front of the grandstand. They'd all vacated the grandstand. And we're, we're thinking, what's going on here? Well, why's all the people gone out of the stand? So we're up there and Hadley, Hadley rings down and he says, what's going on? Where's all the people? What's going on here? So Pikey said they've evacuated me, there's been a bomb scare. <laughs> they never told Kevin and I, we're stuck up the top. And I said, well, Thompson, I said, if we go, we'll go doing something we both love. He said, what, punting or calling? I said, oh, both. In 1966, Len Smith was promoted to the new position of Chief Executive and Administration Officer of the New South Wales Trotting Club. He replaced Jeff Stranger, who was the longest serving official in the club's history. Len Smith wanted a race that would bring Australian horses to the attention of the North American market. His brainchild was the Miracle Mile. He had to sell the idea to the committee about the Miracle Mile, um, the concept of putting on a race for only six horses. And that was going to be probably the hardest thing for him to do, was to sell it. Six horses, you know, like, I mean, What's the idea behind this now from the mobile from the mobile barrier? I said I don't see that that's you know that it'll be any sort of a race. I'm just, I was real clever. I didn't see it was any. It was only that premier race and has been never since it's been invented. You know, but anyway. Runners parade for out of the fifteen thousand dollar Clayton to the Miracle Mile. The inaugural Miracle Mile was run in early 1967. With the added bonus of one thousand dollars, if Mineral Springs mile record of two one and the fifth seconds is broken, an additional four thousand dollars if they run the mile in two minutes or less. Featuring three representatives from New Zealand, a Victorian, and two locals, the Miracle Mile attracted a crowd of more than twenty thousand. Blue lights will flash on uh, every two furlongs, indicating how they're going. They're away, Rachel McGregor ran pretty well out wide, Kung Chris have been driven through in the centre, and four horses racing the line for the first turn. And uh, they had lights, blue and red, every quarter. And if the horse, the leading horse, got to the light before it turned red, it was in front of the two minute barrier. They race down to the next light here, and they've beaten that light by about 10 yards. So they've come to the, the, the second last light, and of course it still stay blue when they've gone past and of course the crowd's going berserk. A great cheer from the crowd as Robin Dunby commences a long run and it's a paralysing burst. Robin Dunby is dashed right away from Tunquista. This could be a miracle mile. Uh, Robin Dunby has gone right out in front of Tunquista under the whip. Then Angelique, Rachel McGregor dropping back Southern Song and Rocky Star. Will it be a miracle mile? Uh, we'll watch the blue light. Robin Dunby is way out in front of the field as they come down to the winning post, hard driven. Robin Dunby may do it, they get down near the line, maybe there's a cheer from the crowd. Robin Dundee beat the lights, come to the second. Angelique Robin Dundee was trained by Jack Walsh, driven by Robert Cameron. All attention turned to the clock. All the crowd was saying, what'd they go, what'd they run, what'd they run? And because we were tight-lipped until we got there and then the time went over 1.59 and the crowd went berserk. Five of the six Miracle Mile runners eventually raced in North America, providing Len Smith with the ultimate vindication. 
Heracles parked up fourth, one out, one back. Then Rainbow Knight and Manavilla. Almost 30 years Next later, in 1996, in Robert Cameron won a second Miracle Mile, time this time as a trainer. Heracles is waiting to pounce. He's right behind them, fourth. Manavilla's taking off now. And Rainbow Knight back to last, down the back. And the leader, El Bacolo, from Norm's daughter. Manavilla went around the outside, three deep. He's got Heracles in the pocket now in the one one. He didn't come out on Heracles. They didn't know I got my tyre chopped off coming up the front straight. It was raining and it, going down the back he didn't feel any good at the time. I couldn't have pulled out and went because probably the tyre and everything was holding him up but I mean if he went there he would have got nothing at any rate so it did, did help when the other horse galloped, I've got to admit that. They're flying, Il Bacolo three quarters to Norm's daughter. Manaville went off stride there and Heracles is going to get out. Sable Eyes can't get a run. Il Bacolo swung for home clear. Norm's daughter the outside, Sable Eyes trying to get out and here's Heracles on the outside. Il Bacolo in front, Heracles is storming home. Sable Eyes getting out late but the boom New Zealander. Heracles takes the lead from Il Bacolo and Heracles gets up to win. Heracles returned a track record mile rate of 1 minute 54.2 seconds, despite pulling a punctured tyre for the last lap. It was a time never betted at Harold Park. Robin Dundee had explosive speed, whereas Heracles would carry his speed a long way. Yeah. Yeah. He couldn't come out and go whoosh, you know. But you, you could come out with her and Jeb really hook into it. In 1968, the New South Wales Trotting Club introduced the R.C. Simpson Sprint. It was named in honour of Robert Charles Simpson. Unrelated to Noel Simpson, R.C. was another significant Australian standard bred breeder. In all, his stallions and mares produced over 1,000 individual winners. He certainly did change the quality of the New South Wales horse, I think, and of course he's remembered for the R.C. Simpson Sprint or R.C. Simpson Memorial for the three-year-olds now. Um, glad to see he still is because uh, sometimes these people get forgotten. The sister race to the R.C. Simpson Memorial is the Wraith Memorial. Jack Wraith was the co-proprietor of Prestonville Stud at Windsor, which stood the stallions Goose Bay and Hyperbole. Goose Bay was the sire of the Brilliant Bay Foil, won the 1972 Miracle Mile. Gay Foyle's going to win. Reitman coming again. Gay Foyle does best. Very close. Oh! That's on two minutes. Either way, very close. Maybe Bay Foyle won 21 races at Harold Park. At the time, it was a record. Named the 1971 New South Wales Horse of the Year, Bay Foyle was trained and driven by Charlie Parsons. Charlie Parsons was a gentle soul softly spoken, had patience and tranquility around a horse. Uh, he loved a problem horse. He hated a problem horse to beat him. And he'd find some way, if it took him three months, to beat that problem. We've had a few, you know, leftover ones, different times and that, but... Uh, so much so that people uh, with unruly horses would take the horse along to Charlie and say, can you fix this? And I was one of them. Um, he was a remarkable horseman. Bay Foyle also won the 1971 International Drivers' Invitation Stakes at Harold Park, when driven by the champion Canadian rainsman, Hervé Fillon. Bay Foyle was also driven by John Heath, the nephew of Charlie Parsons, and a successful horseman in his own right. He combined with Bay Foyle to win the two-year-old Challenge Stakes. The seven Australian record at that time with 2-1 and he was just perfect horse. He came out of the gate really uh, brilliantly and uh, he could race anywhere. He was just a natural perfect horse from right from the beginning. The run home. Bay Foyle finishing well, it's running away from them. Bay Foyle will get first. They come to the straight. In the late 1960s, Stan Joshua's trotter in tangible command created a record that would never be broken. He won 17 races at Harold Park, making him the most successful square gator in the track's history. Another renowned square gator at the time was Kyogle Wirra. Remarkably, he was still competing just shy of his 21st birthday. 
In the 1967-68 season, the freakish Tasmanian Hellwares created a then Harold Park state winning record of almost $44,000. He won the 1968 Miracle Mile in the Australian record time of 1 minute 58.6 seconds. Yeah, well, I didn't come out of the gate hard. I just didn't come out as he, as he wanted to come out, as I recall, and then I've just gone to the front when it suited me. Hellwares well clear, firstly in second place, and drives right out of Austin. The others are all out of the race. Hellwares one time, an easy winner. He's beaten the light. It's a, yes, just ahead of the light. In a time trial the following season, Hal Wes smashed his Australian mile record. Oh, very close. Hal Wes appeared to just beat the light. And the time was a remarkable 1 minute 57.3 seconds. Recurring leg injuries restricted Hal Wes to just 61 race starts. He was victorious in 45 of them. He was an out-and-out -out champion, the horse, there's no question about that. He had a dreadful quarter crack that used to, re, you know, retard his progress to some extent, but he was, um, you know, he'd get pain and he'd just keep going anyway. He was a very good horse, the horse, yeah. Trained by Orb Wesley, Hal Wares shared a wonderful association with the leading Sydney horseman, Kevin Newman. Today we are at the property of well-known trotting trainer driver, Kevin Newman. Born in West Australia, Newman moved to Sydney as a teenager in the early 1950s and was employed by the well-known trainer driver, Bill Picken. <laughs> Tell me this, Bill, um, what is your impression of this new season that's just opened? Oh, well, I think in the, in the new season we should go very good because... The An accomplished horseman, Bill Picken had particular success with square gaiters. His son, Bill Jr., would later become chairman of the Sydney Turf Club. Well, I like it very much, you know, because I've because I'm very much interested in, you know, because my father's got a stud property in the Hunter Valley. Kevin Newman, meanwhile, won eight drivers' premierships and a record ten trainers' premierships. In 1979, he surpassed Perce Hall's driving record of 500 wins at Harold Park. Another Ricky on the outside, coming very fast. Gatari charging, another Ricky, another Ricky beats Gatari An historic occasion. Top rangeman Kevin Newman has recorded his 500th win at Harold Park Paceway. He drove four winners one night and the fifth one you know, struck a bit of interference and run fourth. And I'm pulling up after the race over, went past the winning post, round the turn around at the water tower and coming back. And here they are giving it to me. Yeah, man, oh, oh, gee. <laughs> so, uh, and that used to be on almost every night, you know, yeah. But he, he interacted with the crowd because in those days the track was much smaller. When he was booed he'd give as good as he got and, and when he was cheered he would also encourage the crowd as well. Garrison wins, Garrison first, Ben Paul Mitchie second, close the third between Lord Glenn straight ahead. Bold David, three wide Koala Frost joining in. Kevin Newman was the trainer and driver of the brilliant Koala Frost who won 11 of his first 17 races at Harold Park, including the 1970 Lord Mayor's Cup. Koala Frost doing best and drawing clear as they get down near the line. I could hook him out, he'd come off, say, 36 or 48 in a handicap, turn him half furlong, pull him out at the water tower, approaching the back, into the back straight. He'd be dead last in a field of a dozen, and by the time you turned out of the back straight, you'd launch him, and by the time he turned out at the flat, you'd be two in front and sailing away. Mitchell Victory was another of Newman's top-class performers. He claimed 19 races at Harold Park during the golden era that included Paleface Adios and Hondo Grattan. Paleface Adios can't go any faster and locally are behind them, but Mitchell Victory wins easily. Mitchell Victory first, Paleface Adios second. He was a special horse to me. I, I think he was, I liked him better than any horse I've ever had. Adapter is racing against time to brace Hal Wess's record. He seems... In 1969, the classy Victorian Adapter won the Miracle Mile as a two-to-one-on favourite. Adapter first, he's beaten the light. The Miracle Mile was Adapter's final race in Australia. He was sold to North America for $120,000, plus a $75,000 contingency. It was a record price at the time 
for an Australasian standard bread. In the 1969-70 season, Vic Frost emerged as a major player in the horseman ranks. He won the first of his five drivers' premierships. Frost also claimed four trainers' premierships. I used to work in the coal mine of an afternoon, and I used to work the horse of a morning. And then as time went on, I got more and more horses, and I was starting to drive a few winners, you know, around Harold Park. Down to the line, this big crowd giving this magnificent horse a tumultuous reception. Lucky Frost was the regular driver for the Queensland Lucky champion Lucky Creed, who strung together a then Australasian record of 24 consecutive wins. A record that will stand for many years to come. In one of the most exciting races ever run at Harold Park, Lucky Creed's winning streak came to an end in the 1970 Australia Day Cup the hands of Cocky Raider. Lucky Creed, Frost Anxious, looks back. Cocky Raider out in the centre of the track. Lucky Creed on the rails. Cocky Raider coming with a great burst. Lucky Creed holding the lead. Here's little Cocky tracking up out wide. Oh, a great battle! A great battle! Cocky Raider first. Cocky Raider first. Lucky Creed second. TD Raider third. And the crowd that night was roaring. It was just like I've never heard it before or since then. Like you couldn't hear the hit because in them days we used to have those cane whips, you know, and you could, you, when they hit, hit the horse, it used to go bang, it used to make a noise. You couldn't hear it this night. Cocky Raider won 18 races at Harold Park, including the then equal record of 11 in a single season, many of them from impossible positions. Here's Cocky Raider coming with a bewildering burn now, boys, and that's up the win. The yeah, Cocky Raider was probably the quickest horse I've ever seen, but I was at the showgrounds one night when I was a kid and he was last turning for home and he come down the straight that wide, you couldn't see him because of the crowd, he was copping four and twenty pies in the face and still got up and won, you know, it was just sensational, sensational burst of speed. He was like a little, uh, I used to refer him like a little a boxer, he was like a good fighter, he knew what he had to do. It's Lucky Creed shot world fair. A week after the Australia Day Cup, however, Lucky Creed emphatically avenged the defeat in an invitation, clocking 42.7 seconds for his final 600 metres. Down to the line, Lucky Creed has turned the table. Lucky Creed first, Ford has got second, Lucky Raider got third ahead of Teeny Raider. It was an unofficial Harold Park record. A few months later, Lucky Creed won the 1970 Miracle Mile. Lucky Creed's going to win. Down near the line, Bold David hanging on. Lucky Creed first, Bold David second. I'm a top of great third. Lucky Creed was prepared by Merv Wanless, but Vic Frost would later train a champion in his own right. Westburn Grant shot away. Oh, this is a super horse. Westburn Grant has left four rates standing. What a win. This is a horse and a half. Westburn Grant won 14 races at Harold Park, including back-to-back -back Miracle Miles in 1989 and 1990. Westburn Grant also became the first horse at Harold Park to break two minutes for the 2350 metre journey. His mile rate of 1 minute 59 seconds was stunning enough, but to add further merit, it was achieved as a three-year-old in the New South Wales Pacers Derby. And clap him, ladies and gentlemen, because this three-year-old is an out-and-out champion as he comes down to the post. Westburn Grant is going to win by an absolute mile, 40 metres on the line, I reckon. But while Westburn Grant campaigned in Perth in 1991, tragedy struck. The Frosts learned that their eldest son had died in a freak accident at the family's home. We lost Gary in uh, 91, Christmas 91, and uh, uh, the Benson Edges was, uh, I think, the you know, first week in January 92, so it was only about a week, week or so later. After the funeral, the family forced us to go back to Perth to race Westburn Grand, so he was nowhere in the condition that Vic had him in when he went back, but that horse was just so wonderful. He just sort of sensed the, the feelings of Vic, or something and he pulled out all he had 
to win that final for us. Westburn Grant, can he do it for Frost? He's about to head in front. Franco Ice lifts and comes again. Westburn Grant, Franco Ice, Westburn Grant hanging on. Franco Ice is trying to get him, but he's not going to make it. Westburn Grant wins his second. Westburn Grant has won his second pacing cup. An unbelievable run. It's something that I, I still can't watch the video. I cry when I watch the video. The whole crowd, all you could hear was, come on, Frosty, come on, Spotty. That was what we called Westburn Grant. No one, you could hardly hear them barracking for any other horse, even though there was, every state was represented there. They were all out for us. It was just a tremendous feeling. It wasn't a dry eye across the park. I still have trouble talking about it. It was just a very emotional night, and uh, um, he bet, they bet 10 to 1 that night about uh, Westburn Grant, which uh, I don't think uh, at that stage was unheard of, purely because they couldn't see him being able to, to overcome the, the problems. But um, yeah, remarkable people. Vic Frost was associated with many other outstanding Harold Park performers, including Area Code, True Delight and the ill-fated Glenn's Thunder. Glenn's Thunder's got his head in front and Glenn's Thunder's won it. In 1978, Vic Frost's wife, Margaret, became the first Rainswoman to win a race at Harold Park. It was aboard the 33 to 1 outsider, Pretty Tough. Controversially, Vic Frost had driven the unplaced race favourite. Koala King flashing up out wide. Pretty tough fighting back. Koala King on the outside. Head and head they go to the line. Pretty tough is going to win. And Margaret Frost does it. Didn't need to be a road scholar to work out how the crowd was going to react. After the race, the most sensational demonstration I've ever seen in 40 years ago in Harold Park. They threw bottles and cans and hats and race books and anything you could get your hand on over the fence. Many years later, Vic and Margaret's son Glenn upheld the family name with distinction. When Glenn started driving, we were the first mother and um, son in the world to drive a Quinella, which was a wonderful achievement. Leo Straighten, but Chief Cobra comes at him, there's another fall. Two or three of them down at the top of the straight here. Sadly though, Margaret Frost's driving career was cut short after a sickening race fall in 1995. Greg Turnbull was knocked down in the same race, and uh, another driver, but um, I was taken to hospital, and so many people prayed for me that night, and it's just incredible that I'm alive. It's, it's just a miracle that I can walk again and, and, and do things, garden, and still have an active life. Two race function for the Miracle Mile, Trotting Club Vice President Bill Ryan and with Manaroa's owner trainer Colin McLaughlin, New Zealand. Jack Miles, driver, trainer and part owner of Western Australia's Mount Eden. The other part owner, Bernie Ogden. Neville Johnson, owner of Bay Foil, with his trainer, Charlie Parsons. And that's Buddy King, trainer of Neutrodyne. In 1971, the brilliant but often erratic West Australian Mount Eden produced an amazing Miracle Mile victory for his trainer driver, Jack Miles. When he came over here, and then he blew the start the first time, and then the second time, and they called it a start, and, and, and he's missed away, and, and I said, so I, I'm standing there, and I said, he'll still win. The bloke alongside me, you're joking, aren't you? And Mayfoyle from New South Wales leads into the state from the South Australian deep court. In behind them, Stella Frost in a pocket. Mount Eden is up behind them on the outside of Manaroa. I was sort of travelling all right. Next thing, uh, he came from last and just went straight around a lot of us and smothered us. <laughs> you didn't believe it. You couldn't believe a horse would go that quick. In them days, anyway. They're followed by Mount Eden coming strongly now as they unwind the reins on it. It's a great race, this Bay Foil. Mount Eden dashing up to go on the outside of it. Mount Eden has got to an hour lead. Hard driven, Mount Eden has dashed clear of Bay Foil. This is a magnificent animal. Uh, just running a two-minute mile at the moment. But he set them up a great start. 
by Western Australia's Valley and the dash well clear. They fall in second place. The others are a long way back. They come to the turn. It's all Mount Eden. Mount Eden killing them in the run home. They run down the straight. Mount Eden well clear of Bay Paul. They're followed by Deep Court finishing on. Stella Frost not doing anything. Mount Eden racing down. He'll break the two minutes, I think. Yes, he beats the blue light. A tremendous run. Mount Eden first. But to think that he lost all that ground and he was able to win the way he did, I think that would nearly rank as the greatest performance ever seen in modern times under the ribbon of light. A week after his Miracle Mile success, Mount Eden established a new Australian record in a time trial at Harold Park. He recorded a sensational 1 minute 56.7 seconds. We really couldn't operate very well as a family for three years because the horse was the focus of the family and someone had to be close to or near the horse 24 hours a day. So uh, there was no family sort of outings or, or get togethers or holidays, it was just the focus was just on the horse. Mount Eden was ripe for the North American market, having won 14 of his 20 starts. He was sold for a record $268,000, but he never raced again. Neville Hargraves had a connection with a number of top-class Harold Park performers in the 1960s and 1970s. His most famous association was with the dower New Zealand stayer Manaroa, affectionately known as the Ugly Duckling. But I used to talk to him all the time, and I can't see him, but I used to sing to him and used to watch his ears, and he used to, he used to relax. Yeah. And I never used to grab hold of him, because everyone knew he was a bad beginner, and they used to grab hold of him, I used to give him his head. Yeah. And away, that's how I used to rest. and he never missed away with me, ever. Manaro and Commando fighting it out. Manaro may be doing a little bit. Commando fighting back. It's Manaro, a great horse. Down to the line, Manaro first. Commando second. Welcome Advice, who hailed from Juni, was the leading stake earner at headquarters in the 1971-72 season. He won the 1972 Inter-Dominion in Brisbane and is the only horse to claim all three feature cups at Harold Park in the same season. Welcome Advice was one of many outstanding horses raced by members of the Harpley family. They won the New South Wales Pacers Derby with Ard Drossen and James Darren in 1967 and 1970 respectively. Ard Drossen started odds on in all seven of his Harold Park appearances as a four-year-old. And uh, from New South Wales, Ard Drossen takes out the 1967 Derby Pacers final. Old Sam Maxwell owned him and I was good friends with Sam. And, and uh, I'd had horses before, but they weren't Adrossens. They weren't as good as him. Bonnie Frost can't do any better. Welcome and James Darren was a freakish young horse who won 22 races from 32 starts as a two and three year old before being sold to North America. During the 1960s and early 1970s, almost 700 Australian bred horses were sold to North America. One may have expected Reichman to be another. A brilliant speedster, Reichman was never headed in the 1973 Miracle Mile. He clocked the Australian race record of 1 minute 58.4 seconds. But down to the post, Reichman scores a great win. Reichman had also qualified for the 1973 Inter-Dominion final at Harold Park a fortnight earlier. I still think the 1973 Inter-Dominion at Harold Park was one of the best series ever been conducted. Purely for the simple reason that they ran six heats every night. And there were a lot of horses that ran first and second in a heat that actually never qualified. Hondo Grattan was sent out as the 11 to 4 favourite in the grand final after making a clean sweep of the qualifiers. Dubbed the Bathurst Bulldog, Hondo Grattan was trained and driven by Tony Turnbull. 
into the straight though, Hondo grabs just the leader from Royal Ascot. Jason Singer's under the whip and then Slammer Chief and just too good. Hondo grabs was headed by Royal Ascot, halfway down the straight. Slammer Chief on the outside and now Moby Army. Hondo grabs picking again. Four of them come to the line, locked together. Hondo grabs six and one. Hondo grabs after being headed, picked again and win I say. Well, I, he been working brilliant and he beat them all, and, but I always said if, if you win three straight at Emerald Park, it's pretty hard to win the fourth one, ain't it? Anyhow, so we're in the fourth, I thought, well, if he don't win it, well, you know, he's done his best, anyhow. In 1974 at Gloucester Park, Hondo Grattan became the first horse to win back-to-back -back into Dominion finals. Welcome advice has run into it. Parfait's Adios has come down too. And uh, local products driver has been dismissed. There was carnage at the start. And only a handful of horses left in. But still Hondo was very meritorious. Never forget that race as long as I live. Ah, oh, wonderful moments. But Amar's just in front of Hondo Grattan. Right round the outside. Adios picked it with a brilliant run. And Yalara's well back. In the straight, 150 metres to go. Hondo Grattan goes to the front from Brabama. There's Adios Victor down the outside, finishing five. Hondo Grattan fighting on, and he's going to win two consecutive grand finals. Hondo As a three-year-old, Hondo Grattan won 17 of his 21 starts. One of the few horses to defeat Hondo Grattan that season was bowled by Amy. He won the 1972 New South Wales Pacers Derby. Bowled by Amy and Adios Porter flashing up. Uh, Jason King driving through on the rails, all oh, bowled by him. But back to Hondo Grattan. Such was his public profile, he even had his own song. When you look at the little fella, you don't believe what he can do. He doesn't well, this was uh, the, one of the great surprises of my career. I was in an elevator one morning in a hotel in Perth, and Bill and Bob Webb, who part-owned Hondo Grattan, were in the elevator and they said, look, uh, a friend of the family has written a song. We're going to see if we can have it recorded. We'd like you to do it. Go, 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 you little beauty, Hondo. Go, 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 the fans all cheer. Go, 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 you little beauty. Earlier, in a thrilling and famous finish with Pale Face Adios, Hondo Grattan won the 1974 Miracle Mile. Turnbull first to go for the web on the Little Lagoon Crater. In the straight though, Pale Face Adios the leader. Hondo Grattan, nothing is not game coming at Pale Face. Pale Face and Hondo Grattan. Hondo Grattan moves up to Pale Face Adios. He takes the lead. And his equine dynamo from the Lagoon. Hondo Grattan has won the Miracle Mile. The crowd just the cheering, you talk about the noise that they lifted the roof, head and head, all the way down the straight. Marvellous, marvellous finish. I can feel myself shiver now when I think of it, and the little Hondo just bang on the line. Yeah, it was amazing, because they're two great horses, and you know, the younger generation doesn't realise, you know, um, those horses used to go on the track, and they, they get an ovation every time they pass the stand warming up before the, before the race. And, and uh, they were so popular and, and for two great horses to fight a race out like that was, it was, uh, you know, it just really got your blood pumping. In May 1986, the pair returned to Harold Park as teenagers to stage a rerun of that epic Miracle Mile duel. Colin Pike and Tony Turnbull they gave back to the industry in the country what, what they took out of it and they'd take those horses to uh, all the tracks and they'd race in the free-for-alls. A year younger than Hondo Grattan, Pale Face Adios won all three Eastern States derbies in 1973. He was a long odds on favourite on each occasion. But Pale Face Adios been shaken up and beat Mitchell Victory a long neck, three lengths away for two and a half. Pale Face Adios may not rate as the best pacer ever produced in Australia, but his deeds over ten seasons of competition are mesmerising. Trained and driven by Colin Pike, the Tamora Tornado had a less than auspicious debut at Harold Park as a two-year-old. Oh, there's a big up there, world cap, 
The driver of uh, two of them are out of the spider, John Pepper, they're both up and OK. He clipped the wheel in front and f fell straight down and did a somersault and was in backwards in the car. I thought he was dead because he was lying. He was dead underneath it and that. But he got up and everything was all right. Pale Face Adios returned the following week and effortlessly won a heat of the sapling stakes. And down to the line, it's all over. Pale Face Adios is beating them easily. Pale Face Adios became the first three-year-old in Australasia to break two minutes under race conditions. He clocked one minute 59 seconds to win the RC Simpson sprint at Harold Park. Paleface Adios contested a record seven miracle miles between 1974 and 1980. He won the race in 1976. It's better than a dream. I mean, a dream that you never think it possible that it could happen in some of those races. And, it, it, and yet it, to happen to you, it's, it's just something. Paleface Adios holding the lead. Don't retreat, trying to bridge the gap. Paleface Adios hanging on. And Paleface Adios wins from Duncan Street. I mean, a lot of those horses, too, that made a difference. You owned the horse. You loved the horse. Other, a lot of those other people liked the horse and that, but they didn't, didn't own them. Paleface Adios was the first horse either standard bred or thoroughbred to win 100 races. He reached the milestone with victory in the 1980 Cranbourne Cup. Paleface Adios was the pin-up horse. He was the rock star. You'd be racing around the backyard thinking you were driving Paleface Adios. Colin Pike's brother, Keith Pike, drove Paleface Adios numerous times. He also had a more than handy horse of his own. Just Too Good, Just too good was another son of Deep Adios. He won 54 races, including 12 at Harold Park. Well, that was a bit of a <laughs> sore point to, a what in, uh, to start with because uh, we sort of wasn't going to take him to the races until we knew he could run a bit. Because <laughs> my father named him, of course, and who else would have named him just too good, you know? But when he started winning races, the name seemed to fit all right, you know? Just too good, getting it to work now, and it's coming clear. Wins easily, just too good. The strongest push to sell Harold Park for almost half a century occurred in 1973. It was proposed that the New South Wales Trotting Club relocate to Homebush Bay. The debate gained and lost momentum a number of times over the next 15 years, till it reached a crescendo in the late 1980s. We had a look at the people that um, asked for catalogues who were interested in trotting. And most of them came from west of, uh, actually, Parramatta. A, a different type of people have moved into Glebe and, and those areas. It's, uh, it's become a, a pretty expensive place for residentials. But in the end, the club stayed at Harold Park. In 1975, the star Kiwi gelding Young Quinn was regarded as Australasia's best horse. He confirmed that rating with a slashing last to first win in the Miracle Mile. Clear away, Adios Victor, Royal Gaze, Mitchell Victory going hard out in the centre to try and lead. And down to the first line, Adios Victor's going to hold Mitchell Victory up. And down the first corner, Adios Victor gets clear of Mitchell Victory, Royal Gaze and Pale Face, Adios Hondo Zatton. And Young Quinn's last out of the mobile. The press that morning really didn't give him a chance. Um, and uh, I think the late Bill Whittaker was writing for the press at the time and he said, you know, this horse has never raced on uh, a half mile track. Uh, he, uh, he, his gait wouldn't help him round that track and, uh, and his driver's never driven on Harold Park so he had, and he'd drawn six, no horse had won from six. So he had everything against him. Into the straight, Adios Victor, the Royal Gaze, Pale Face Adios, and Young Quinn coming down the outside with a great burst. He races quickly up on the outside, what a great animal, the New Zealand champion. And down to the line now, right away, for a big win, and right ahead of the time, Mitchell Victory second, Royal Gaze. 
Well, he'd been in such terrific form, he, he, you just couldn't be surprised at what he could do, you know, at that stage. He was just so good. It's Rip Van Winkle. Here's Tidy Blue out wide, finishing strongly. But now he eases the rain on Rip Van Winkle and moves away. Easy win. In Rip early 1976, the Michael Vanderkemp trained and driven Rip Van Winkle kicked off a stunning career that would see him emulate numerous records. We had about five names picked out. Went stripped to bed one day and then, and behold, got a Van Winkle mattress. So two and two, and she just said, well, there's a, there's a, the last name when we sent them off, and that's what they sent back. It was just meant to be, I suppose. As a two and three year old, Rip Van Winkle won 15 races from just 17 starts at Harold Park. His sequence of 11 straight victories at the track eclipsed the previous record held by Fettel. As a four year old, he raced without cover for the final 1400 metres to win a star studded Spring Cup. Rip Van Winkle, pale face Antios has the lead. Down the outside, Koala King, a great finish. Rip Van Winkle, Koala King on the outside. Oh, a bad ball there, two tumble out. Past the Finlay and Duncan Street. However, Rip Van Winkle beat Koala King and uh, pale face Antios. Rip Van Winkle's training regime included regular visits to the beach. The influence for this type of therapy came from Kevin Robinson, who had an imposing strike rate with unsound horses. Robinson trained at Seven Mile Beach near Berry on the south coast of New South Wales. Our dad was the the best horseman I've ever seen, not just because he was my dad, but um, all the horses looked immaculate and he was just had a great eye for a horse and he could just tell when they were ready and you know, he's a great horseman. Could do anything with a horse. It's Lee George leading Billabong Keepers, flashing home, little between them, they get near the line, it's nothing in it. Lee George may have beaten Billabong Keepers. Robinson was also an outstanding rainsman and claimed the Harold Park Trainers and Drivers Premierships in the 1975-76 season. You know, I mean, you talk to horse with your hands. Unless you've got good hands, you, you never make a driver. And I'm, when I say a driver or a rider, it, and you, you do talk to us with your hands. But around the turn in the grand final, and you can hear the cheers from Berry on the south coast as first Lee booted away for Kevin Robinson. Holy he won the 1968 Inter Dominion Grand Final at Alexandra Park with first Lee. But getting close to home, and first Lee is a mile too good, and first Lee wins the grand final for New South Wales. Holy Hal second, in third place, running on gamely, is Blue Pennant, followed by Vista Abbey. Bob Kevin Robinson won seven races aboard the Victorian champion Gamalite, including two Harold Park Cups in the early 1980s. Robinson also trained the open class stars Frosty Imp and Bill Student, and won 22 and 21 races respectively at Harold Park. Robbo had a remarkable record with young horses in feature races at Harold Park during the 1980s. The majority of them were driven by his son, Terry. He's never ever criticised me for one drive that I've had, and you know you come back and you've certainly butchered a few, but yeah. it's just it's just wonderful that you can, we've got that, uh, he's had, got that ability to let it go and he realises you've made a mistake and that nothing needs to be said. Kevin Robinson also trained more than 200 winners for the high profile owners Bill and Ron Truer, including the brilliant Under a Cloud. And down to the finish, another up-and-coming champion, under a cloud, Lord Plancho second, Sunset Ringo is In 1978, Bill Truer replaced Bill Reinan as the president of the New South Wales Trotting Club. He took over at a precarious time. While elements of corruption have always existed in racing, Harold Park entered a dark period. It had been infiltrated by the most powerful players in Sydney's underworld, including Lenny McPherson and George Freeman. Yes, there was an aroma about it. Uh, certain drivers was named by several people who said they were in the swim, organising races. And uh, it, 
at that particular time that the sport was tarnished. There were rorts and it was mainly because there was SP bookmaking. There was a, an SP bookmaking ring in Sydney and there was a central figure who was controlling activities. I actually met Freeman uh, through a, an associate and, and that and I sort of said no I'm just going to row me over the boat. Oh at the time I never said anything, he said get back to me. I had a bit of a yarn to a few people and uh, they, you know, said no, it's you know, the money's good but it's a no-brainer sort of and I just said no and that was it, yeah. But it, you know, probably easy could have went the other way. I was never directly approached at all. Um, I've felt a couple of times that my horses were involved, unbeknownst to me. A car pulled up on the main road. We lived at Londonderry near Richmond and in between Penrith. And I was only a young fella and um, I, st I remember the colour of the car still and it pulled up and we are walking from my grandmother's place to my father's place on the same property, probably 500 metres apart and we heard a couple of loud bangs coming from this car and they were directed, I don't know whether at us or to scare us but we, Dad had an old Massey Ferguson tractor there and we hid under, hid under that for a a good 10 minutes. And My brother, <coughs> in his own inevitable away, he, he said, this fella's got to go, he's got to get off, he's got to be off that course. And it was all arranged that uh, the following Friday night, when he comes, there was people there to meet him. But somehow it got out of the bag and the fella never turned up and he never went back to Harold Park. George Freeman.